We're going to move on to the second panel, and I'm going to make the introductions right now. Uh, Mr. Mike uh, Mavramatis is a 48-year-old American who lives in Columbus, Ohio. He owns a family restaurant in uh, Columbus, husband, father of three, grandfather to two. He's an addiction survivor, having recovered from addiction to Vicodin, a prescription pain medication. He serves on the board of trustees at Central Ohio's oldest and largest sober club, which hosts uh, 20 12-step peer support meetings per week. He's also a member of the National Alliance of Advocates for uh, uh, Buprenorphine Treatment. Uh, welcome, Tikanis, and uh, we appreciate Hello. your presence there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Samet is Professor of Medicine and Public Health at Boston University School of Medicine and Public Health. He's also Vice Chair for Public Health uh, there. Uh, additionally, is Chief of the Section of General Internal Medicine at the uh, Boston University School of Medicine and Boston Medical Center and Medical Director of the Substance Abuse Pro uh, Prevention and Treatment Services for Boston Public Health Commission. He's a director and president-elect of the American Board of Addiction Medicine. His research addresses substance abuse and HIV infection from health services behavior and epidemiological perspectives. Mr. Greg Warren is the president and CEO of Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems. His organization directs the prevention, treatment, and strategic planning for drug and alcohol treatment in Baltimore City. Uh, the organization has received awards and been recognized nationally for its innovative work in changing the way substance abuse treatment is delivered and financed in Baltimore City. Previous to uh, BSAS, he was the Director of Substance Abuse Treatment Services for the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services for the State of Maryland in this role he expanded substance abuse treatment for incarcerated offenders. Mr. Orman Hall, MA, has been the Director of the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board since 1989. This board is responsible for planning funding and monitoring all public behavior health services in Fairfield County. Previously, Mr. Hall was the research and evaluation director for the Tri-County Medical Health Board in Troy, Ohio, and president of the Ohio Association of uh, Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Boards. Mr. Charles O'Keefe is a professor in the Institute on Drug and Alcohol Studies and Departments of Preventive Medicine and Community Health and Pharmacology and Toxicology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Previously, he was president and CEO of, uh, of Reckitt Bankheiser Pharmaceuticals, Inc., served in the White House for three presidents as advisor, special assistant for international health, and deputy director for international affairs in the Office of Drug Abuse Policy. He served on U.S. delegations to the World Health Assembly and U.N. Commission on Narcotic Drugs. He was instrumental in helping Congress reach consensus on the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000. Finally, Mr. Richard Pops, chairman, President, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Alchemist, and uh, he's previously served as uh, its Chief Executive Officer from 1991 through 2007. Under his leadership, Alchemist, is it Mies, Alchemist or Alch Alchemist, has grown from a privately held company with 25 employees to a publicly traded pharmaceutical company with more than 500 employees and two commercial products. Mr. Pops currently serves on several boards of directors, including Biotechnology Industry Organization, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, and the Harvard Medical School Board of Fellows. Uh, this is also a, a, a very distinguished panel and much appreciated uh, to have all of you be here uh, for your testimony. It's the policy of our uh, committee on government oversight and reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that uh, you rise, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As with panel one, I would ask that each witness give an oral summary of your testimony. Uh, please keep this summary under five minutes in duration, uh, up to five minutes. And your complete testimony will be included in the record of the hearing. And what you don't get a chance to uh, uh, recite in your testimony, uh, I assume that during the question and answer period, you'll be able to cover some of the points you want to make. So I would ask uh, that 
we uh, begin, uh, let's start with uh, Mr. Mavromatis. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Kucinich and committee members, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, give testimony at, uh, at this hearing. It's obviously something that's very near and dear to my heart and my family's. Um, I'm, a, I'm a father, a husband, a grandfather, small business owner from Columbus, Ohio. Over the years prior to 1999, I served on many uh, community boards, business associations, coach sports, and, and uh, so on. In 1999, while remodeling our, our uh, family restaurant, I uh, sustained an injury. Didn't think much of it. A couple months later, it didn't get any better. Visit the family doctor. The family doctor uh, proceeded to treat me with Vicodin, starting at two tablets per day, one in the morning, one uh, in the afternoon. Over a four-year period, uh, uh, I, I would, that, that treatment increased to basically 120 tablets every 12 days. During my time with my doctor, I was always honest. I, I never asked for more medication and relayed to him how I felt honestly and earnestly. How that changed my life. I became uh, very withdrawn from my family, uh, business, life in general. My social life was gone. I was no longer an active husband or parent, and uh, and I was I was caught in a uh, in a uh, downward spiral. So as with anybody, I tried to find out what what was wrong, what changed in my life. Obviously, it wasn't old age. Uh, only that that was setting in um, or or anything else uh, my weight was increasing uh, so I, I went through the process of elimination and what it came down to was my chronic pain issues and how I was being treated for it so I decided to uh, stop the Vicodin stop taking the Vicodin one day and uh, when I did that I within five six hours I was in severe uh, withdrawal and uh, and and the reality of of, of uh, my situation became very clear. That transpired into a, a situation where I was trapped in a a deep dark place by fear, guilt, and shame. I no longer had the ability to freely choose. Um, I uh, instead of being able to do the logical thing and and seek help, uh, I tried to self medicate. I went to twelve step groups. I tried to uh, detox myself from Vicodin. I tried to uh, wean myself from Vicodin. Each time I tried, I failed. My, uh, my daily use increased with, with each failure. And uh, the, by the time uh, I entered treatment in uh, February of, of 06, my use had increased from 120 Vicodin every 12 days to 100 or more every day and I was spending up to one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year to support that daily use in 06 when I started treatment my weight had increased from 99 to 06 in 10 years to 305 uh, pounds I was passing blood in my urine and um, worst of all I was no longer a husband or a father um, and I was just a shell of the person I used to be to try and find solutions, I, uh, be, because I finally reached a point where, where, where this disease had brought me to my knees, and I had, to, I, had to, um, I had to either find real solutions or just give up and die. I, I started online, and, and online I found um, information about Suboxone. Uh, on a site, naabt.org, not only did I find the vital medical facts I needed, and overall educational material about the disease of addiction, to which I was actually naive to prior to this, um, they offered a doctor-patient matching system. And through that system, I was, I was able to uh, get in contact and begin treatment with a local addiction specialist. Uh, this offered me the, the, um, the opportunity to be treated 
with dignity and to continue my life um, without needing to uh, go away for 60, 90 days or, or whatever it would take. Uh, when I started Vicodin, uh, or when I started the Suboxone, the induction process was, was interesting because after about 90 minutes, I felt as though I had never taken Vicodin before in my life. I felt no high or euphoria sensations from uh, Suboxone and, and honestly felt normal for the first time in years. From there, through um, good instruction and education and incorporating Suboxone into an overall recovery program, a, a very encompassing recovery program. Uh, that, uh, for, for those of you who are new to this hill, uh, that means that uh, the House is about to enter into votes. Is that right? Three votes? Uh, so what I'll do is I'll hear testimony from Mr. Mav Ramantis and then Dr. Samet, and then uh, we will take a, um, a break of about about 30 minutes for votes, and we'll come back and pick up where we left off. So you, uh, as soon as those buzzers stop ringing, you can, you can proceed. Go ahead. Um, through, through, the, through taking the Suboxone and implementing it with a, a full and encompassing recovery program based on education, understanding, and, and peer support, I was able to put my life back together. Um, now it's been four years and uh, four months later, and I've had no relapse, no desire, um, and, and um, I'm back to being an active uh, father, husband, grandfather, and a small business person in my community. Uh, there's some that choose to debate whether uh, uh, the uh, addiction is truly a disease or simply a choice of, of, of action. I ask them to look at the facts of what I have experienced. My brain has been biologically altered. It may or may not totally return to a pre-contraction state, though I am healed from this disease in terms of putting it into remission. I will always be susceptible to it. I will always have to live my life differently with certain limitations and a more attentive health regime. I will have to do this just as a person who suffers from heart disease would, just as a person who suffers from cancer or diabetes would. Um, over, over the uh, past four, four years, I've had the opportunity to work with, with other people uh, like myself who have experienced the same on a daily basis. Um, many of them are veterans through our local VA and, um, and many online and, and in person. Of those who have, um, have, have taken Suboxone and worked at the program earnestly, and when I say that I mean within the confines of a full and encompassing recovery program, um, the success has been really, really well. So. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, we're now going to, and, and, and thank you for your courage in coming before a congressional subcommittee to testify. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit out of my water, but thank you. Actually, uh, your presence here is quite meaningful, and your family and your community should be very proud of you uh, being here at this moment. So I thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Samet, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, I welcome the opportunity to testify on pharmacotherapies for substance use disorders. ASAM is a national medical specialty society of more than 3,000 physicians. ASAM's mission is to increase access to and improve the quality of addiction medicine and treatment. I am a general internist with expertise in addiction medicine and a professor at Boston University School of Medicine. I have followed patients in primary care at Boston Medical Center since the 1980s. In our urban primary care clinic, 400 patients with opioid dependence receive buprenorphine. 
In my other role as medical director of the Boston Public Health Commission's Substance Abuse Services, I oversee physicians who work in the opioid treatment program and provide care to approximately 400 patients who receive the medication methadone. These medications enable patients to change their lives for the better. These two medications are among a limited number of effective pharmacotherapies available for the treatment of addiction. As physicians who care for patients with addictions, my colleagues and I understand how critical effective treatments, including medications, are for individuals with substance use dependence. Addiction is a treatable chronic illness, as you've heard, and treatment yields benefits, as you've also heard, for individuals, families, and society. Like other chronic diseases that I treat in primary care, such as diabetes and hypertension, medical management of addiction may include medicines that are taken for prolonged periods. These treatments, we know, improve patients' overall survival, decrease drug use, decrease transmission of HIV, decrease criminal activity, increase social functioning, including employment and housing. I provide direct patient care for approximately 50 patients with opioid dependence. I have found buprenorphine to be a highly effective medication. Most patients, as you've also heard, have found it to be transformative, and transformative in the good direction. We also manage the state hotline for those looking for buprenorphine treatment and get calls about eight to 10 a day from individuals across the state. Readily accessible treatment for this condition is critical as we are losing about two people a day to opioid overdose in Massachusetts. Buprenorphine and methadone are opioid agonists because of their pharmacology. Neither of these medications cause euphoria in patients who are opioid dependent. I realize that stories can sometimes convey the value of our actions one brief one, in 2003, a 20-year-old woman was referred to one of my colleagues by her mom. Mom described the daughter who had a heroin addiction, had experienced multiple overdoses already, and mu undergone multiple detoxifications. The daughter was evaluated and begun on buprenorphine. She stopped using with the assistance of the medication, attended self-help meetings, and seven years later has remained clean and sober, in treatment, on treatment, graduated college with honors, and works full-time in New York City now. In September 2003, we started a collaborative care program to provide buprenorphine treatment with our primary care clinic to accommodate the large demand. Our model resulted in feasible initiation and maintenance of buprenorphine for the majority of our patients. With this model and the support of the state to expand treatment, buprenorphine is now provided in 14 community health centers, and another 1,500 patients receive this truly life-saving medication. One challenge I have encountered with pharmacotherapies is insurance discrimination. Some insurers simply refuse to pay for addiction medications. We hope that once the wellstone Dominici parity law is fully in effect, this inequity will be remedied. We ask that Congress use its oversight authority to see that this law is enforced and individuals can access their benefits promised to them under the law. Unfortunately, there are fewer pharmacotherapies to treat addiction today than there are for other chronic illnesses. For my HIV-infected patients, compared to 1990 when we had one medication, there are now more than 20. In 1990, there were three medications to treat addictive disorders. Today, there are five. That is an improvement, but nowhere comparable to the need. If we had more medications for addictive disorders, we would be able to put them to good use. In closing, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Millions of Americans are living productive lives in recovery, and you heard that before. We see it in our clinics. ASAM remains committed to working with policymakers to ensure that all Americans who need treatment are able to access it, high quality treatment services. Access to new pharmacotherapies would be of great value in enabling us to do just that. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Uh, we are going to recess here until approximately 1230 at which time we will resume with testimony from the rest of the witnesses and then we'll go to questions. I thank you for your presence here and we'll uh, be in recess until 1230.